Hi, this is Paul. I made this video on Tuesday, and Tuesday evening I got home, and my wife was like, I feel a little chilled. And I thought, so do I, which was kind of unusual. So I put on a hat, a hat because, of course, my head gets cold now because it's lacking hair. And I put on a sweater, and then I noticed it was 75 degrees in the house. I thought, well, I'm kind of jet lagged, and I've been traveling a lot, so maybe it's nothing. And then I woke up the next morning, Wednesday morning, and I thought, no, nah, I'm definitely sick. So I got one of those COVID tests out that we had a whole bunch of them stockpiled because they're giving them away free. And of course, well, they're giving them away free. I'll, I'll take some. And so I uh, pulled out one of those home COVID tests and took it. And uh, yeah, it, it didn't have to wait 15 minutes. It was like that. You watch that little solution go across the thing and it got to the T line. It's like, bing. So COVID positive. All right. And uh, had fever and headache. Had headache for about Wednesday. And fever, maybe 100.5. I measured it at one point. That was what it was. And uh, so stayed in bed pretty much most of Wednesday. Um, and then Thursday morning, woke up, thought, I feel pretty good. And um, fever about 99, 99.0. Um, I was like, eh, still got a little fever. I woke up this morning and thought, I feel good. I feel good. So I don't know. I just took another thing and it's still bright black. But I'm... I'm in my office. Nobody else is in the building. Nobody else comes in my office. It's uh, it's my own little isolated. I have my own door that comes in from the outside. So my wife uh, yesterday afternoon when she got home from school also tested positive. So she was, she's home today. And I said, well, I could do a video at home or I could go and do it in my office. And she was like doing her own thing. And for me to do it in the house would be very loud. And uh, so she said, and then she'd have to be very quiet. So she said, well, I should go do it in your office. So, so here I am going to make a video. Wanted to make a video. I have all these videos in my head during all of my travel and no chance to get them out. So uh, we'll see how much stamina I have to, uh, to make this. It could be that halfway through, I just kind of, you know, conk out. Um, had a couple of phone calls this afternoon that were fairly long and took them and so yeah, we'll we'll see we'll see if I have stamina to do this. So that was where we left off. Words that fudge consciousness, and a bunch of people said, "Oh, we have to talk about consciousness." Okay, I'm I'm gonna continue on there because that was only sort of the first half of the the talk that I gave at Thunder Bay. I saw uh, Grim Grizz had a Thundercats episode on Thunder Bay. So um, yeah, <laughs> I thought it was pretty clever. But let me let me let me pick up where I left off on Thunder Bay. So got all the way to the talk about spirits. And those of you who have been around the channel a long time know a lot of this already. It's about school spirit because a couple of years ago, I was trying to figure out how can I communicate, how can I understand what we mean by this strange word spirit or spiritual. And actually a lot of these ideas came to me as I was teaching my adult Sunday school class. That's before I was really posting them on this channel. And because we, we have school spirit and we all seem to understand that and all of the elements of school spirit are, are pretty obvious to us. No one is seemingly in charge of school spirit, although various authorities have responsibility for it, but they're not really in control of it. The spirit, the principal wants a positive school spirit, but school spirit is sort of intermingled and and great and deeply embedded in the spirit of the town, the spirit of the architecture of the school, the um, the culture, the spiritual legacy of the families of the school, the teachers, the cheerleaders, the nerds, the potheads, the jocks, all of those people. Often when I get sick, I always think, I'm not really that sick. I'm just making this stuff up. So then I try and do things and then I get halfway into it. It's like, oh, maybe maybe I still am sick. We'll see if we'll see if that happens with this video. But school spirit is collective and it's participatory and it's, it's generated by the culture of a city or a town and there are principals and teachers and students and athletes and cheerleaders and nerds and potheads and all participate and are subject to it. In fact, school spirit is vitally important as any principal will tell you. There's some schools that have just very negative spirits and students don't learn well and you know people survive it and they come out of it but they it, it changes them and in that sense spirit or spiritual is a is a deeply formative thing and we we readily accept that in terms of a school spirit when we talk about the spirit of a nation well that that isn't terribly alien to us either but now post Descartes 
I mean, Descartes sort of set us on a path to imagining that there's a spiritual substance. And, and part of what I think modernity said was that there is no such things as a spiritual substance. Okay, well then then what do we mean by that? Because we certainly haven't given up using the word. People use it all the time. And one of the things that I learned as a pastor over the years, especially in an evangelical church, people would say, well, that's that's a spiritual matter. And so then I'd stop them being the, enorm the annoying trollish pastor that I am and say, could you tell me what you mean by that word? And suddenly people when you're not supposed to ask a question like that. We're all we're all supposed to act like we all know what the word means, but none of us should be called to account to try to explain the word in other language that would make it intelligible for people. And okay, quite fair. That should really be the job of the pastor, and that's why I stop you and ask you, because I'd, I'd really kind of like to know what you mean by the word. Now, there are, there are many spirits among us, and um, once you begin to see spirit in this manner, you see that there's a spirit of your marriage, and there's a spirit of your meeting, and there's a spirit of a conference. There was definitely a spirit of the Thunder Bay Conference, and once the, once the recordings are out, you'll hear about that. Um, I mean, Catherine says at one point when I asked, you know, why did you want to do this conference? Well, I, I wanted us to leave a spirit here, and so then I, you know, very much pointed out that she used that word here and said, "Okay, well, we'll we'll leave her and we'll say we're going to leave a spirit here in Thunder Bay." And then if I phrase it that way, suddenly it's jarring to us and it sounds spooky or or, or somehow not relatable, even though the way she said it, it's it's perfectly colloquial English, and everybody just nods and says, "Oh yeah, we understand what that means." There's a spirit of a nation, and, and there's really too many to count because they're all intertwined, and it's sort of like the wheat and the tares. Now, now, now some spirits begin with us, and, and they go way beyond us. They, they outlive us through, through what we create and, and, and through how we relate to others, sort of cultural transmitters. Now, Jordan Peterson, of course, was, was famous in terms of talking about archetypes, and, and one way to sort of think about archetypes would be sort of as spirits. They, they form and they shape, but they, they, we certainly participate in them. We certainly manifest them. Actually, uh, Grim, I should pull up that. that I thought it was a, a, this is a very interesting Thundercats that Grim Grizz uh, pulled out. Now, Thundercats are a little bit uh, younger than I am. Um, the Thunder, I, I imagine already, I was already, I don't know when Thundercats were. I got to look that up. So here's Grim Grizz's video, Thunder Bay Dreamin', and um, and then he goes on to play this this episode of Thundercats, where you know how do we fight a ghost? And well, we fight a ghost with our spirit, and then it just goes back and forth, and then they, of course, they, the Thundercats, the Thundercats, of course, win the day. Thundercats is an American media franchise featuring a fictional group of cat-like humanoid aliens. The characters were created by Tobin Ted Wolf and originally featured in an animated television series called Thundercats running from 1985 to 1989. So I was at, I was actually at Calvin Seminary during those years. And so not, didn't have a lot of opportunity to watch Thundercats when I was at seminary and, uh, being engaged to my the woman who would be my wife and learning theology and getting married so thundercats wasn't really big on my list um which was animated by japanese studio pacific animation corporation co-produced by rankin bass animated entertainment so um yes yeah, so it's those of you who are younger than i am well then you'll then you'll know thundercats and uh yeah i don't but, but I thought it was an interesting selection in terms of this, this question of spirit that Grim Grizz put together. And then, of course, as, as I played in the last video, there's th this question of Darwinian relevance realization and how does that work unless there's, there's some degree of, and I think C.S. Lewis, it's reason in Lewis's um, miracles, in Lewis's book, Miracles, um, that, that really sort of gets the whole thing going. The whole premise behind evolutionary biology and psychology is that selection based on grades of consciousness, gradients of consciousness, have been shaping things for a very long time. 
um, and these transjective qualities seem to rise um, to give rise to them. And then, of course, Peugeot has talked about spiritual bodies, and, and that word body is the word we use all the time. I mean, this is, this is simply the language that we use, and we use it in sort of a sleepwalking fashion, and we don't think a thing of it. We have a congressional body. We have the, we have the congregational body. Now, of course, that language comes from the Apostle Paul, and it, it comes on down through us. You have the church body. You have the civic body. And, and what is a body? A body is a, a physical instantiation of something that is fundamentally spiritual. What do I mean by spiritual? It's, it's something that shapes it. Now, at the conference, Peugeot gave, I mentioned this before, after Peugeot gave his lecture, uh, John Verveke walked by me and said, that's the best talk I ever heard Peugeot give. And I thought, yeah, that could very well be the best talk I've heard Peugeot give. Because what Peugeot sort of laid out was this, he sort of brought together all of this gestalt idea of um, how love and desire for the good sort of snap coherence out of combinatorial explosiveness and, and as I said earlier, sort of gives gives a logo shape. As I said earlier, that was in the sermon that I gave, so I don't know that, that any of you have heard that yet. Anyway, it's a little, it's a little, it's a, it's a, it, yeah, it's a little trollish for me to be talking about videos you're not going to be able to see for a couple of weeks. I know that, but just just keep it in the back of your mind. Think about all this as a teaser. And and so you have these spiritual bodies. And what do I mean by the spirit? Well, you have the spirit of the congregation or the spirit of the city, or you have the spirit of the Congress or the spirit of a meeting or a spirit of a ma marriage. And that spirit then gets instantiated and played out in the city. The reason Philadelphia has a different spirit from, let's say, Chicago has different from Milwaukee, is different from Sacramento, is different from New York. Now, everybody knows these cities have different spirits. And everybody knows that all of the people are, of course, sort of like school spirit, contributing to, to, to manifesting and demonstrating the spirit of the city, also morphing it and changing it. When, when cities build skyscrapers or great emblems of public works, these are, these are attempts by the heads of the city um, to change the spirit of the city, to elevate the spirit of the city. The Tower of Babel, of course, was in a sense that attempt so that you know, they, could, they could own the spirit of the city. Now, if I talk about the, that in different ways and other biblical ways, you could talk about the principality of a city. Now, now the principality of the city is sort of the, the hierarchical... Um, the hierarchical spirit of the city very much in mythological and, and symbolic language. So cities definitely have different spirits and anybody who's lived in different cities knows those spirits. Now to actually be able to articulate those spirits, we usually have, you know, you have the big apple, which is New York. And if you've lived in New York or by New York and you know New York, you know New York has a sort of a spirit. And then you travel to L.A. and L.A. has a different spirit. And I was only in London for a very short time. But if you're completely new, you get a sense of the spirit. And the you're longer you're there, you're, you get a higher resolution picture of the spirit that is London or New York or Los Angeles or Chicago or San Francisco. And there are emblems of that. And then... And, and it's, a, it's a public thing. People can people will point to it and say, yeah, that's more New York and that's more Los Angeles. That's more San Francisco and that's more Chicago. And, and that's Santo Domingo. And this is more Barahona in the Dominican Republic. And, and this is like the, the spirit of my hometown. And there are songs and, and all of this. And, and so then what, what you have there is you have the, the body of the spirit. That, that gets manifest in the city. And this is the language that we use, and it's perfectly capable language, and it's perfectly correct language. Now, now people will say things like, well, there's, um, well, what does that prove? Well, it, I'm not looking to prove anything. I'm looking to illuminate something and help us to see something and and ask questions about, well, what is the, what is the, what, what is the nature of spiritual power in the world? 
I mean, part of what, see, now I got, I sat next to Mark Lefebvre for all that time in Thunder Bay. And see, this is the thing about spiritual things. You sit next to Mark Lefebvre for two or three days in the, listening to all of the talk in Thunder Bay and he colonizes a part of your mind. That's, that's what we do. I've been colonizing parts of your mind. And so I've got OMR in my mind, um, objective material reality. And that's his, little, that's his little catchphrase on his channel, navigating patterns. Uh-oh, is that, did I get his channel right? Um, and we, again, we like to think that, well, um, material is foundational and spiritual is something that emerges from the material. And spirit can emerge from the material and from material manifestations. You can change the spirit of a city with by using material objects, but it's almost never the um, it's almost never the it's it, it's the meaning of the material object. It's the it's the spiritual communication of that material object. Let's say, if I introduce a flag to the city, does that make a change? Well, it depends what's on the flag and what the, um, what the meaning of that flag is. Recently in Sacramento, there was a lot of, some students were putting up certain symbols. I won't talk about what those symbols are. Any of you can guess what those symbols are. And suddenly it, it causes the attention of the whole school district and the New York and the papers get it. And, oh, we want to show that there's no racism permitted in the school. And, well, what they learned was that any kid who wants some attention and wants to sort of cause a stir in the spirit very quickly learns that um, putting up certain putting up certain symbols will cause a stir, whether they are in fact actually promoting racism or anything like that is sort of beside the point because they simply wanted to use that symbol to stir the pot of the school or the city. And you can do that. Now, again, you might say, well, that's, that's emergent of material. And I'd say, well, not really, because that's, it's not the materiality of the symbol that matters. It's how that symbol plays in the world now oh, well for, i also mentioned that you can feel group consciousness so one of the things that i did at thunder bay and we did a lot of in europe was we ran through some basically samples of an estuary group and for those of you who are unfamiliar with estuary the estuary protocol is basically a conversational tool by which people get a chance to democratically create a conversation together. Usually, when you have a small group conversation, there's a leader and that leader is saying, this is what the conversation is about. If you have a meeting, uh, someone says, this is what the meeting is about. But what the estuary protocol does is allow the group itself to decide what it wants to talk about in a way that is resistant to somebody sort of forcing its will on the group. And so what you can sense in the middle of an estuary conversation is sort of the the little collective consciousness of the group beginning to rise. And again, if I use the word consciousness there, nobody bats an eye because that's how we use the word. Now, we know when we're saying the group's collective consciousness that it's not exactly the same kind of thing that I would say my consciousness is. Now, having just had the very recent experience about being sick, I could notice that when I had a fever, uh, it was impacting my consciousness in some ways. I'm, I'm very sensitive to fever, and when I have a fever, it's like I feel a certain way, and it's like I have a fever. And I dream in certain ways and all of that. So, so fever obviously affects my consciousness. But the group has, develops its own, like the conversation has its own consciousness. And in that way, there's a deep connection between spirit and consciousness. And, and so you can feel that. And in fact, a lot of what we do over time, in fact, a lot of what history does is talk about the change and the transformations of, of group consciousness as we go through time. Now, the rest of history this week had an excellent two-part podcast on China during the Second World War. 
And as many of you know, I'm, I enjoy reading histories of the Second World War. I've just been, I've done some of James Holland's books on the Second World War. I did Ian Toll's really excellent trilogy on the war in the Pacific. And, and what I found is that almost all of these books gave too little attention to the, 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 the huge transformations that happened in China from Admiral Perry's coming up until the rise of the, um, oh shoot, now I can't remember, this is a little foggy still, but the Meiji, is the Meiji Restoration, and then the rise of Imperial Japan all the way to the end of the Second World War. And Randa Mitter has that, a book that I've just started reading, Forgotten Ally, on... Um, uh, with much more detail on China during the Second World War, and I'm I'm just that's what the that's what the last two episodes of the podcast were about, and I'm just I'm just eating this I'm just eating this up with a spoon, and I've started I've started in on the book, and now that I've had some you know a little bit of extra time because I've been sick, I've been listening to the book, and and really enjoying it. Now I want to I want to jump in on where he's going to treat a little bit because again the focus of this book is on China. At some point I'd really love to have um, do some more reading on the modern history of Japan because part of what's interesting about how this history happened in Asia is that a lot of what happened in Europe and the UK and Germany, the Protestant Reformation, the Enlightenment, the Industrial Revolution, I mean, this stuff went on to impact the whole world. And what other ways do we have of sort of conceptualizing this? We just look at it as history and processes and all of that. But when, when you think about these transformations, they're, they're deeply spiritual they deeply impact religion, and part of why I'm interested in is because I'm always interested in sort of the loss of what secularity calls religion. So I want to I want to pick it up here at the sort of the beginning of the story of Japan's transformation in, with respect to how that then would impact China. And and why am I listening to this? Well, again, I want us to think about this question of what do we mean by spirit? What do we mean by the consciousness of the body of a nation? In fact, what do we mean by China? I was having a conversation with someone in the UK and you know when I when I talked about someone last time, CW was like, Yeah, it was me and my wife you were talking to. Why didn't you name us? It's like I don't usually name who I have these conversations with because they haven't given me permission to have these conversations with. This isn't about CW. This is someone in the UK that I was talking about too. And he told me that he hadn't voted for Brexit, but even but when it passed, he was sort of glad it was because in his mind the EU was sort of a a, a renewed Franco-Prussian Empire. And, and it just made me think, especially looking at, say, China's new sort of consciousness warfare, how it's trying to sort of say to Taiwan, you've always been a part of us. You're just a part of us. Don't resist us. And, and all of the new sort of psych-op games, sort of consciousness games going on, and identity games. Part of what I think we see after the Second World War and with probably the once nuclear weapons come into the fray, we're seeing warfare not so much with guns and bullets, but with, well, I can take over a nation if maybe they all buy Apple products and they all listen to American music and they all watch American YouTubers. We can take over the world this way. And I think part of what um, provoked the Russian invasion of Ukraine was that they simply saw that Ukraine was just continually to be sort of absorbed into European culture and absorbed into, and Ukraine would rather be part of Europe than of Russia. And Russia looks at that and says, they're, they're absorbing us. Well, let's take a look at some of the, some of the transformations that happened in Japan and, and, and what provoked them. In the second half of the 19th century, while China floundered, its traditional little brother had taken a very different path. After the First Opium War, it was Japan's turn to confront the West, this time led by the United States. In 1853, Commodore Matthew Perry sailed into Tokyo Harbor, 
requesting that Japan abandon its centuries of near isolation and open itself to a wider range of trading partners. Perry's demand was politely issued, but it was backed up by the force of gunboats. The next decade and a half saw a major crisis in Japan. And, and Perry's invitation was politely issued, but as he said, it was backed up by the force of gunboats. The Japanese, I don't know, again, the only computer game I play with any regularity, and even that's not terribly regular, is Civilization. Up to Civilization VI now. And maybe while I'm six, it would be a good time to play some more Civ. Um, you have this experience when you're playing Civilization. Maybe you're, you're sort of stuck on an island and maybe there's one or two other cultures with you and you're sort of tussling with them. But you, you haven't really had a chance to get your, your little boats out and to get a sense of what else is going on in the world. And then suddenly, let's say maybe you've still got um, crossbows and city walls and a battleship rolls up into your harbor and it's like uh-oh even if the battleship doesn't do anything you realize if this other civilization wants to take me over I don't stand a chance suddenly you have a change in consciousness now one of the interesting things about China is that it's so massive and they, they, they go from an imperial or a monastic frame to now this new frame where Mr. Democracy and Mr. Science are, are clearly what the nation needs and so everybody has to get it. So, so Perry comes in with his gunboats and said, we'd like to trade with you and Japan begins to realize if they come in not so politely, we're cooked. What do you do? It's a change in consciousness. And as the shoguns, the Tokugawa family who acted as regents on behalf of the emperor, found they had no solutions to offer to ward off the foreigners. One scion of the family, Tokugawa Nariaki, advocated all-out war. If we put our trust in war, the whole country's morale will be increased. He claimed. Look, look at what they're doing now. Okay, so if we put our trust in war, the morale of the country will be increased, and so we'll, we'll be able to level up in terms of the country, and, 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 and we'll mobilize. And when you, let's say, look at Ian Toll's book on the Second World War, well, that's, that's what Japan did. They mobilized the entire, just look at the word, they mobilized the entire country. And and then they had this idea that, well, the Americans are devils. And then, of course, when, when GIs began to land for the American occupation of Japan and the GIs are handing out candy bars and mostly behaving well, suddenly then the, the Japanese turned on the, old, turned on the old administration and said, you lied to us about everything, and they felt betrayed. And even if we sustain a defeat, we will in the end defeat the foreigner. But few agreed with him. And the political turmoil caused by the foreign threat led not to a war against the Americans, but to a coup against the shoguns. After a short civil war in 1868, the Tokugawas were replaced by a very different sort of aristocratic elite, who decided that the way to repel Western imperialism was to embrace wholesale modernization. Knowledge shall be sought throughout the world, declared the Charter Oath of the new regime, so as to invigorate the foundations of imperial rule. Okay. Knowledge shall be sought throughout the world. It's like you're playing civilization. Go out there and you better catch up on technology. And so Japan sort of focuses. And as a nation, it's it starts now. Now, you don't change the consciousness of a nation right away because everything that you have is sort of deeply embedded in everything. And so it's a, it's a transformation that happens. But the speed of transformation in Japan is absolutely breathtaking. The reformers carried out their actions in the name of the emperor, whose reign title was Meiji brilliant rule, and the period has therefore become known as the Meiji Restoration. In reality, it was nothing less than a revolution. Japan had been a feudal aristocratic society, largely agrarian, with little foreign contact. Christianity and firearms, both dangerous influences that might upset the social order, had been outlawed. By 1900, within just three decades, Japan had been transformed. It had a disciplined, conscripted army and a constitution and parliamentary system. It was Asia's most heavily... In now, now look at that. 
in, in 30 years, it has a constitution and a parliamentary system, basically borrowed by what they had seen in other places, adjusted, adapted, alien, yes, no, always with a purpose of its own. But again, think about the change in the spirit of a nation. Now you'd say, well, some of the Japanese spirit persists, and that's true. Because what you see then by the time of the Second World War is that ancient elements of it make it uniquely Japanese, even though they're taking from everywhere else. Industrialized society, exporting goods around the world. By the start of the 20th century, Japan had nearly 60,000 kilometers of railway tracks and 700,000 tons of shipping. Its leaders had created a modernized, industrialized state in record time. Japan had also secured another essential element of a powerful modern nation state in the late 19th century, an empire. In 1894 to 1895, Japan took on China for control of the Korean Peninsula, traditionally an area of Chinese influence. 20,000 Japanese troops made a daring assault on the fort of Weihai Wei on the coast of China's northern Shandong province and turned their guns on the ships of the Chinese Navy, sinking five of its finest vessels. China had to send diplomats Prince Gong and Li Hongjian to the city of Shimonoseki in Japan to sign a humiliating treaty. As Gong put it, he was piecing together the cup which the present ministers had smashed to the floor. Now, now pay attention here. Japan has sort of imbibed of the spirit of the West with some of these things. Some of these things, of course, were in, you know, imperialism was, was part of the world all over the place, dominating one's neighbors, um, my well-being at your expense. But now Japan is doing to China, of course, what the European powers had been doing to China. And China, well... But even just look at the language here, China. What do you mean by China? This this geopolitical thing, this this thing that we have a line around, this this ethnic people. Um, it, it's, but that's the only way we can talk. It's the only way we can conceptualize. It's the only way we can sort of work this. The Japanese not only claimed control of Korea, which they annexed formally in 1910, but the island of Taiwan as well, which remained a Japanese colony until 1945. In 1904 to five. Japan pulled off an e and you know even that little tidbit that they annexed Taiwan and it wasn't until I was started reading more of these pieces the, more of these books on the Second World War and the Pacific War did I realize oh they own Taiwan oh wait a minute they had they had dominated Taiwan for a very long time and now of course Taiwan is at the center of of other because Chiang Kai-shek has failed um, regime retreats to Taiwan and, you know, all the drama between mainland China and Taiwan persists today. Even greater coup. It fought for influence in Manchuria, the northeastern province of China where Russia had established a colonial presence. <coughs> Japan paid a heavy price. Over 80,000 of its troops were killed by wounds or disease. But thanks to Japan's military skill, the war ended with Russia's defeat. It was the first time that an Asian power had overcome a European one and the achievement drew admiration from colonized and vulnerable peoples around the world. So, okay, consciousness. How how does Japan Japan's so if you you follow any of that, so of course everyone has these racist ideas about Japan. Wow, and they can't win against a real European power. Russia was a real European power. Russia tries to sail its fleet all the way around and and Japan just cleans their clock. Japan just mauls them in the war. And suddenly the world takes notice. But not enough notice, because of course, once the war would really get going, um, and Japan would do what it did to, let's say, the American fleet at Pearl Harbor, and the Japanese the, the Japanese pilots were excellent, and their torpedoes were excellent, and they had a tremendous amount of skill, it would take a little while for you know, the nation that had so much more industrial and economic might to finally catch up, which the United States would do, and then and then just completely dominate Japan, which many in Japan knew would happen eventually. Japan just hoped to sort of beat them with their fighting spirit. In September 1905, the two powers met at Portsmouth, New Hampshire, to sign a treaty mediated by President Theodore Roosevelt, who would later win the Nobel Peace Prize for his efforts. Russia had to hand over the rights to the Liaodong Peninsula, 
a strip of land on the east coast of Manchuria that contained the strategic port of Dalian. The Japanese then built on their gains by setting up the South Manchurian Railway. Much more than a transport network, this was a commercial, semi-governmental organization modeled in part on the British East India Company. It gave Japan a strong foothold on the Chinese mainland. The Russo-Japanese War also had a powerful impact on the Japanese public. Songs such as Comrade became popular hits, with lines such as Here, many hundreds of leagues from home, the red setting sun of distant Manchuria shines down on a stone at the edge of a field beneath which my friend lies. Such songs fueled a growing feeling that Japan had earned its territories in China at a high cost, and that this sacrifice gave the Japanese a special role in the neighbor's land. Okay, is that not a change in consciousness in China, in Japan, in Russia, in Europeans, in Asians? Consciousness would be the word that we would use for that. This special status was spelled out most clearly by the stationing in Manchuria of the Kwantung Army. This force, initially made up of some 10,000 men, was supposed to protect the interests of Japanese citizens and business interests in the region, in particular the South Manchuria Railway Company, SMR or Mantetsu, which was the primary instrument of Japanese colonialism in the region. By 1933, its numbers had increased dramatically to over 114,000, and it gave Japan a powerful advantage in its quest to control North China. By the early 20th century, Japan was an Asian power that had remodeled itself as an empire with continental ambitions. In stark contrast, China had been thoroughly humiliated. Now, now, again, think about that word. Now, people might say, yes, but these, this is all built on human consciousness. Absolutely it is. Again, once the videos come out, Jonathan Peugeot has some really interesting ideas about this, some of the stuff I hadn't really heard. And Jonathan said it first, and it was sort of like, hmm, I'm really going to have to think about that, Jonathan. But he's got some really interesting ideas about sort of the son of man and consciousness of these kinds of things. And again, once and maybe Jonathan will make some videos on it, I don't know. But I, I thought they were really helpful and intriguing ideas that he that he brought to this question of how can we speak about the consciousness of China? Look at what we just said again. N nobody. I mean, this book was written, uh, I think, 2013, something like that. So almost a decade ago. Nobody, he, in this book, he wasn't in any way thinking about this little conversation that we're having in this little corner of the internet. China was thoroughly humiliated. You say, well, that's personalization. Yeah. Why? Why do we talk this way? Because it works. Because, what well, is every single person in China humiliated? No, that wouldn't be right. The spirit of China gets humiliated. I was watching, oh, shoot. Oh, wonderful little documentary on on Netflix. So my wife's home and she's like, you know, it's, it's like, I get to watch TV in the middle of the day now. <laughs> it's like, okay, if you want to. And so we watched this wonderful little documentary on Rubik's Cube and these Rubik's Cube things. And one of the things that I noted, so, so the, one of the two top Rubik's Cube speed solvers of Rubik's Cube lives in Australia. And, and one of the things that I noted when I was in Australia was this this Australian inferiority complex. And, and the Australians told me about it because I had never thought of it with respect to them. And then I go to Canada and I hear about sometimes there's this Canadian inferiority complex that people have this inferiority complex. And the nation has, to a degree, a sort of inferiority complex about some things. And I always thought that was strange. And Nobody thinks America has one because America doesn't seem to have one. But that's, you know, part of the consciousness of the nations. They all seem to have their own consciousness. And, and again, we don't control it. We don't participate. Certainly wars and historical events and politics and all of that goes to, goes to shape it. But... That I was the, another movie because my wife and I have time at home, and so I, she, I, I just sort of randomly picked up a, a UK movie called The Bank Job that was about, um, I guess, based on a true story. And I'd heard bits of this story before, where they they basically cooked up some um, small time criminals to break into a safe deposit box so that they could. Um, 
get some salacious pictures of of Princess Margaret that were sort of being used by a political bad actor to keep himself out of jail and allow him to do a whole bunch of things. And it was a it was it was a it was a fun movie. I'm sure some of you have seen it and you'll know what I'm talking about. But again, well why would why would the nation care if the queen's younger sister had been doing some things and you know this is this island and that was it mystique that she was she had her boyfriend she's i mean all this stuff that happened there um what's going on with that in terms of the consciousness of the nation it had lost its first all-out war with its little brother and then had to and, and notice you know china's little brother is japan and, well, why use language like that? Big brother and little brother, especially in an Asian culture where, you know, with Vietnamese, you, for your whole life long, where you are in the birth order in the family is ranked and maintained. And so, for example, at a wedding, if your father is not the eldest of the brothers, the oldest brother will stand up and speak for the family, not the father of the bride. So, I mean, all of these nuances but they all come into what we all talk about in terms of the consciousness of a family or the spirit of a family and the consciousness of the nation and the spirit of the nation you say well you're using that word metaphorically well um we can't seem to to come to agreement on exactly what that word means it's it's very very difficult and i would say that there's an analogy between these elements to accept that rival imperial powers, including Japan, could occupy large parts of its territory with impunity. Feelings of resentment at Japan's actions were mixed with respect for that nation's ability to regenerate itself. Now, now this is very interesting because this shows the nuance. On one hand, they don't like Japan because of what it's doing. On the other hand, they respect Japan because Japan seems to be doing what the British had done. But Japan are one of us. Fascinating. Even the Chinese Guangxu Emperor expressed his admiration for the Meiji reforms in a conversation with Japanese Prime Minister Ito Hirobumi in 1898. The government of your honorable country has been praised by all nations. We request your excellency, Ito, to tell our princes and great ministers the process and methods of reform and give them advice. Okay, so you've done this. How can we participate in doing this? Just a few decades earlier, it would have been unthinkable that the emperor, the son of heaven, would ask an official from the small islands to the east for advice on any topic whatsoever. The growing strength of Japan led many Chinese intellectuals to think of new ways out of the crisis, drawing on the political philosophy of the West, the region that had dominated China so successfully. Yan Fu, who studied naval technology in London, became the first translator into Chinese of Herbert Spencer, Ah, uh, now it's getting really interesting. The Victorian social scientist who coined the term survival of the fittest. Spencer argued that races and peoples, not just species, were competing for mastery. His central ideas were later characterized as social Darwinism and are now dismissed as pseudoscience, but they proved very popular in East Asia in the late 19th and early 20th centuries as they seemed to provide a rational explanation for the decline of the Asian powers as well as a potential solution. The young Mao Zedong, among others, was deeply influenced by such ideas. He used them to voice his opposition to the traditional Confucian respect for order, harmony and hierarchy, instead embracing the idea that violence might be the necessary transformative power that would drag China into modernity. What China needed was a man who would charge on horseback amid the clash of arms to shake the mountains by one's cries. Ah, so what happens... Well. Let's use violence. Well, where's the, where's the reluctance? I mean, of course, in the West, you've got something built into these Christian nations about violence that says, hey, wait a minute. Um, and, and that continues to, seems to continue on with this strange ambivalence in the UK. As someone said, um, it might have been on the Rest of History podcast there, it, so, sort of the, the the discontent with empire. I mean, the 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 British Empire was one of the most successful empires in all of human history, 
But but deep down, there was an unease with respect to that empire, which had to be put there by Jesus. Despite such new thinking, the Qing's grip on power became ever weaker, even as Japan gained strength. Attempts at reform were half-hearted. Now again, look at the language. The, 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 Qing, the Qing dynasty that had been in power for quite a while, they're losing their grip on power became even weaker even as Japan gained strength. Now, you say, well, that's metaphorical. Yeah, it's, it's metaphorical, talking about very concrete realities that are determinative over the lives of hundreds of millions of people. And was stymied by conservative figures at court, including Tsi Chi, the Empress Dowager, who acted as a force behind the Emperor's throne and was vehemently opposed to political change. The Boxer Uprising of 1900 had proved a disaster for the dynasty. Tsi Chi and the court had come out in support of the rebels and their anti-foreign campaign, only to see the boxers crushed by a 20,000-strong force made up of the soldiers of eight nations, including Japan. The dynasty was made to agree to a massive indemnity payment to the foreign powers. There was a final effort to turn things around in the first decade of the 20th century. From 1902, the dynasty instituted the Xinjiang New Government Reforms, which drew strongly on the Japanese example. These were designed to turn China into a constitutional monarchy, with elections steadily being introduced at a local, then provincial, then national level. Okay. Why are we going to turn China into a constitutional monarchy? What's with this voting? I mean, part of what's interesting about the history for the next 150 years will be how often... Well, clearly the nation isn't doing well. What they need are elections. And, you know, the, the second Iraq war. Well, once we topple Saddam, it's just elections will break out and, and Iraq will become just a, a flourishing example of democracy for all the Middle East to follow. Is it, is it really that simple? What goes into that? What... What's with the spirit of these nations? What's with their consciousness? Does democracy work just by saying so? The reforms late in the Qing might have had some chance of success in a country that was already more unified and prosperous. However, the dynasty was running low. Okay, unified. What does it take for them to be unified? Well, to sort of have one consciousness or one story or one sense of themselves or or one something. We sort of skip over it, but again, it's all in here. Low on people who had a vested interest in its survival. There was a serious agricultural crisis in the countryside. Military power had now been diffused to the local level, and the newly emergent middle classes, visible in new institutions such as chambers of commerce, formed a locus of power that owed little to the central government. For nearly a thousand years, Chinese dynasties had held sway through their control over the bureaucracy, entry to which was dependent on a series of examinations. But the examinations themselves had become ossified, demanding knowledge of classical precedents that seemed to have little relevance to the pressing problems of the day. In 1905, in one of its boldest moves, the Qing abolished traditional examinations in favour of a new system demanding study in sciences and foreign languages. However, this alienated large numbers of elites who had spent years, in some cases decades of their lives, studying for the bureaucratic examinations and now found their ladder of opportunity snatched away. The end of the old system created new opportunities for learning that had never been available to an older generation of Chinese. Some 30,000 Chinese students travelled to Japan for further study in the three decades leading up to 1937. Notice that Japan now becomes sort of the... This is the place where you go to learn about the successful new ways of, of, of living in this new world. This was a sharp reversal of past practice. Asians had always come to China to learn, but now Japan was the mentor. Chiang Kai-shek, for instance, attended the Shimbu Gako in Tokyo, a school set up to enable Chinese students to study military strategy. Among his fellow students was He Yingqin, who would become his minister of war during the conflict with Japan. Chang was not a popular student, regarded as aloof and withdrawn, but he was respected for his capacity for sheer hard work. Chang's three years in Japan would instill in him admiration for that country's sense of order, discipline, and commitment to modernization, but its imperialist intentions would also make him deeply wary. 
By the late 19th century, many Chinese despaired of the possibilities of gradual reform and began to plot nothing short of an overthrow of the Manchu dynasty. A new political philosophy was on the rise, personified in the revolutionary leader Sun Yat-sen, a Hong Kong-trained physician who was also a practicing Christian. Sun became convinced that the Qing would never revive China's fortunes, and spent much of the 1880s and 1890s moving among Chinese communities overseas and forging links with traditional secret societies, fomenting opposition to the dynasty. He even led a secret organization in China. The Tong Meng Hui aimed at overthrowing it. The Qing in turn put a price on his head, forcing him to flee to Japan. He failed to ignite an uprising, but his patriotic credentials and charismatic presence inspired many Chinese nationalists, including the young Wang Jingwei. Wang Jingwei is less remembered today than his contemporaries, Chiang Kai-shek or Mao Zedong, who would also seek to lead China during the war with Japan. Yet in the first decade of the 20th century, he was better known than either. When he met individuals, Wang often appeared diffident. But in front of a crowd, he was transformed. A Japanese journalist who knew him declared, He always spoke in a very, very low voice in small groups. But in a crowd of 3,000, he was just like a crazy lion. He was a great orator. Now, what does that to people? Why in front of a crowd will he suddenly, well, he'll, he'll, he'll somehow partake or that something spiritual is happening that transforms him in some place from, from what he is in other ways? Wang was born in 1883 in Guangdong province, although his family originated from Zhejiang, the same province as Chang. Like his two contemporaries, Wang was seized by an early conviction that China needed salvation and that he was the man to do it. In 1905, Wang joined the Tung Meng Hui and quickly rose in influence. Unlike Chang or Mao, he gained national prominence early with his daring public persona and his public speaking skills brought him great fame. Wang enjoyed his glamorous image. He was startlingly handsome and would build on his charismatic good looks by writing poetry in which he portrayed himself as a selfless patriot who cared little for his own life. Wang Jingwei likewise chose Japan for his further studies, arriving in 1904 for a course in law and politics. While there, he served as one of the editors of the Minbao newspaper, whose passionate rhetoric called for revolution in China, and one of whose readers was the youthful Chiang Kai-shek. Aged only 22, Wang had emerged from his Japanese experience as a fully committed revolutionary comrade of Sun Yat-sen. Sun and Wang both hailed from the southern province of Guangdong, and throughout his life Wang would associate with other figures from this region, which had always looked askant. Now, now it's interesting here because, of course, the communism is this these i i mean marx's ideas are sort of permeated throughout the world now but they're they're only going to be permeated out the world through the network of ideas that are being transmitted from the west of course you've got and and so but they're getting picked up by by mao and and you have all this revolutionary and comrade talk and all of this stuff going on at rule from the northerners in far off beijing Wang traveled extensively with Sun in Southeast Asia, using his rhetorical skills to inspire the region's ethnic Chinese to support the overthrow of the dynasty. But revolution seemed unlikely. In 1910, Wang decided that he would substitute action for words. He masterminded a plot to assassinate the prince regent, Prince Chun, with a bomb timed to go off under his carriage. He was assisted by a young woman named Chun Bijun, Chen was the daughter of a trader from Southeast Asia, and she was a feisty and provocative figure as dedicated to revolution as Wang himself. Soon after meeting, they were married, and Chen took a full role in all Wang's activities. Some years later, Wang would remark, She is my wife, but she is also my revolutionary comrade, and for that reason I don't find it easy to make important decisions without considering her views. The plot was discovered, and Wang was arrested and sentenced to death. His sentence was then commuted to life in prison. The reasons for his reprieve remain unclear, but one factor must have been the extraordinary fame that his action brought him. Okay, the consciousness of a nation. Well, you can't kill him because, well, why can't you? Well, some more fanciful suggestions hint that a highly placed lady at court was swayed by his extraordinary good looks. To many patriots, the assassination attempt gave him the status of a true national hero, and the dynasty could not afford to have him become a martyr. Wang wrote poetry that burnished his own image as a patriot willing to die to save China from the dynasty which oppressed it. To explain his turn to violence, 
Wang referred to the newspaper editorials he wrote as a young man studying in Japan. These articles were written in ink, declared Wang. I wanted to translate them into blood. The combination of melodrama and commitment was typical of the man. Driven, ambitious, vain, and also shaped by a streak of recklessness, Wang's willingness to throw the dice when the odds were long would shape his political life all the way into wartime. Now, now remember, he's roughly forgotten. I didn't know his name until I listened to the Rest is History podcast with this author talking about him. But he was more famous, I just showed you a picture of him on the cover of Time magazine, than Chiang Kai-shek or Mao Zedong. Now, of course, Chairman Mao at this point is the most famous, Chiang Kai-shek after, and Wang largely forgotten. Young Chinese like Wang took great inspiration from the activities of the Russian nihilists and terrorists with their anarchistic philosophy. Not all Russian anarchists were violent, but those who were glorified their use of violence. Sofia Parovskaya, the Russian revolutionary who had masterminded the assassination of Tsar Alexander II in 1881 and was subsequently executed, was so much an inspiration to the young Chinese writer Ding Ling in the 1920s that she named the lead character of her most famous story the diary of Miss Sophia, after her. Wang Jingwei, as a thrower of bombs at Manchu princes, was a direct inheritor of Perovskaya's legacy, although he was fortunate enough to escape her fate. Now notice again how spirits move between us. Despite the upheavals in society in the late Qing, there was no certainty that revolution was in the wings. Few could have foreseen the consequences of events in the central Chinese city of Wuhan in the autumn of 1911. Where is that? Well, there's a Chinese there's a Chinese district we're all familiar with today. The city was alive with rumors that the Qing government wished to sell railway rights in the region to foreign interests. In this atmosphere of unrest, a small group of revolutionary soldiers in the local garrison were discovered, but not captured, in the midst of their bomb-making preparations for rebellion. They had been planning attacks on local officials, but realized that they must seize their moment or be arrested. They marched to the military headquarters and held up the commander at gunpoint. They gave him a choice, be shot or announce on their behalf that on that day, October 10th, he was declaring the city's independence from the Qing dynasty. He did so, and within days there was a chain reaction. Now, now again, pay attention here. So you have the, the head of the body declare the city's independence from the Qing dynasty. Well, that word goes forth and matter responds. That's how the world works, right? A city after city declared independence from the regime. Provincial assemblies filled with the representatives of the new politically empowered merchant classes all declared themselves part of a new republic and named Sun Yat-sen as their chosen president. Okay, part of a new republic. Well, well, what, what is that? Did you make that in a factory? Is it something I can lay my hands on? Or what is it? How does it work? How, how does it arise? Sun himself was not in China, but in America on a fundraising trip when the revolution broke out. The news quickly spread among young patriots ready to bring down the dynasty. Chang rushed home from Japan and gained his first experience of combat by commanding hastily assembled revolutionary troops in his home province of Zhejiang. The rule of the Qing proved highly brittle. A local uprising quickly ignited and was sufficient to bring the whole system down. By the end of the year, the dynasty was on the brink of collapse. Yuan Shikai, the warlord who controlled the Beiyang army, the biggest in North China, went to the court with a proposal. In return for the abdication of the six-year-old emperor, Bu Yi, Yuan would ensure that the imperial household was given suitable accommodation and an income. On February 12, 1912, the last emperor of China abdicated, and China formally became a republic. Suddenly, thousands of years of history, how everybody knows to behave. Whoop, now it's a republic. Is it? Will it be? Can it happen so fast? Why not? If it's, it's not absol absolutely not arbitrary. At first there were high hopes for the republic, but from the earliest days it was clear that power lay not with the political parties and parliament, but with the militarists. Yuan Shikai swiftly used his military strength to force Sun Yat-sen's resignation and install himself as president with the complicity of foreign powers that favored a military man in charge rather than the less predictable Song. Wang Jingwei was released from prison just after the revolution broke out and Yuan offered him the premiership of the new republic. Wang declined, 
Rather, in the manner of a traditional Confucian scholar, he chose to withdraw from political life rather than be corrupted by a flawed system. There's a spirit of a culture going on. Others carried the mantle. General elections were set for late 1912, and Sun ran at the head of his newly formed Nationalist Party, Kuomintang or Kuomintang. Okay, Nationalist Party. Well, there's a there's a spirit that seems to be lighting all over the world, spirit of nationalism, that we can say, well, here's a flag, here's a name. Let's The idea of China will be the spirit around which we, we, we put all of our energy. He handily gained the largest group in parliament with 269 out of 596 seats. But China's experiment in electoral democracy, while real, was very short-lived. On March 20th, 1913, an assassin walked up to Sung Jiao Ren, the nationalist's brilliant young nominee for prime minister, and shot him. Sung died of his wounds soon afterward. Everyone assumed the assassin had been sent by Yuan Shikai. Yuan quickly dissolved parliament and banned the nationalist party. Sun fled to Japan deeply disillusioned. China's new republic was plunged into turmoil. Europe became caught up in its own crisis just a year later as the Great War broke out. This gave Japan, now unquestionably the strongest power in the region, the opportunity to bolster its own position in China while the Europeans were distracted. In January 1915, the government of Prime Minister... You notice in all of this that what sets up the Second World War is already well underway before even the First World War happens in Europe. The Okuma Shiganobu presented Yuan Shikai with a set of territorial and political demands that would give Japan immense advantages in everything from trading rights to the placement of Japanese advisers within the Chinese government. Yuan's position was still weak, and in May, 13 of the original demands were formalized by treaty. Yuan remained president until 1916, when he died of uremia. For the next decade, China was split among warring militarist factions. Although the international community recognized whichever government was installed in Beijing at any given moment, many felt that China was a geographical expression rather than a country. Ah, right there. It's a geographical expression rather than a country. Well, what's the difference between a geographical expression and a country? Well, it's a spirit. It's, a, it's, it's, it's something. We all know it. We can sense it. We wonder about it. Nobody's in charge of it. No individual human being can make it happen, although... Um, powerful leaders try to bring it into being. You know, you look at, yeah, Bismarck. I mean, Bismarck brings Germany from a for some sort of a linguistic expression into a country, into a nation. Italy struggles with that. The early Republican era was not all bleak. Despite the chaos, it led to one of the finest flowerings of culture in China's modern history. In 1915, progressives launched a new culture movement that aimed to liberate China from the constraints of outdated thinking. The movement gathered pace after Yuan's death, sparked by the 1919 signing of the Treaty of Versailles, which ended the Allied campaign against Germany in the First World War. Under the treaty, Germany had to give up its territories on Chinese soil, along with all its other colonies around the world. The Chinese assumed that the territories would be restored to the Young Republic, as a reward for the efforts of the nearly 100,000 Chinese workers who had been sent to the Western Front in Europe to assist the British and French. Probably didn't know they were even there, did you? But the territories were awarded instead to Japan. The Western Allies turned out to have made simultaneous secret agreements with both China and Japan in order to bring them both in on the Allied side. Once again, Japan's actions on the international stage were wreaking havoc with China's internal politics. The reaction to this news in Beijing was swift and angry. One student at a public meeting threatened to kill himself with a knife in protest. His fellow students quickly mobilized, and on May 4th, 19... Think about that. Well, I'm going to protest. I'm going to kill myself with a knife in protest. It's like, oh, this affects what? Oh, it affects our consciousness. It affects our psyche. It affects who we imagine we are to each other. In 19... 3,000 students from the capital's finest colleges marched through the legation quarter of the city and set fire to the house of a government minister whom they condemned as a traitor to the nation, an apologist for Japanese interests. The students sparked a wider movement that vowed to use Mr. Science and Mr. Democracy to revive a society suffering from warlordism within and imperialism from outside. Right there. I'll just highlight it so I can find it again later. 
the students sparked a wider movement, vowed to use Mr. Science and Mr. Democracy to revive a society suffered from warlordism within and imperialism from outside. Wow. The demonstration was over in a few hours, but the aftershocks helped to transform Chinese society and culture for decades to come. The new culture movement became intertwined with the May 4th movement commemorating the demonstration. Patriotic Chinese demanded technological development and political reform that could rescue China from its seemingly eternal weakness. In 1921, amid this upheaval, a fledgling group, the Chinese Communist Party, held its first Congress. Socialism was one of the many Western ideas that had flowed into China late in the Qing Dynasty, and radical exponents of the doctrine were further inspired by the outbreak of the Russian Revolution in 1917. Li Dajiao, head librarian of Peking University, declared, the victory of Bolshevism is the victory of the spirit of common awakening in the heart of each individual among mankind of the 20th century. Did you hear the language he used? The victory of Bolshevism is the victory of the spirit of common awakening. It's sort of a consciousness word, isn't it? In the heart of each individual, but not really each individual, that's sort of the picture that we have, among mankind in the 20th century. Wow, that's a big statement. This by a librarian. Chen Duxiu, the university's Dean of Humanities, was at the meeting, as was one of Li Dajiao's library assistants, a young man named Mao Zedong. The assembled figures all felt that China's social problems, not least the burning question of foreign imperialism on Chinese soil, needed a radical solution. Yet even these optimists could not deny the size of the crisis that faced the country. The revolution seemed to have failed. How could China save itself? And, and so the answer of all of this was a new spirit, a new consciousness. Isn't that always the answer we give to the problems that we have? Uh, what my body needs is a new spirit. What my mind needs is a new consciousness. What we need is a new collective consciousness. we I mean, we've been hearing this. Well, you'd think it came out of the 1960s counterculture. This is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. I mean, all that consciousness, spirit, language was all in there. But we're talking the beginning of the 20th century, all the way over in China. And it's all the same language. Well, why? This is the way the world works. All right. That's probably good enough for me. I'm getting a little bit tired. I did want to do something and, and get some of this out. I know that the Peugeot, Peterson, Douglas Murray conversation was excellent. Hopefully I can get to that. I have to see whether or not I have to do a video for church on Sunday. We're trying to get a, uh, a pinch hitting preacher to come in and preach for me, which would be nice. Um, but we'll, we'll see. So thanks for watching. And um, let me know what you think in the comments.